Angels Care Home Health, serving Hayes and the surrounding areas, is a Medicare-certified home health agency providing quality skilled nursing and restorative therapy services to patients in their homes. I love the nurses that come and see me. Angels Care is there to help 24 hours a day, and all services are covered 100% by Medicare for patients who are eligible. Since I learned about Angel Care, I would recommend them to anybody. Angels Care Home Health. We serve patients. Eagle Community Television presents Community Connection with your host, Mike Cooper. Hello and welcome again to Community Connection from Eagle Community Television. Thanks for watching. Thanks as always to the producer and editor of our series, Jeff Durall. And with camera two, Brandon Cooley from Eagle Community Television. We're at Tamanic Hall, second floor on the campus of Fort Hayes State University with the chair of the Department of Geosciences at Fort Hayes State and associate professor, Dr. Grady Dixon, our community connection. Talking about tornado season this year once again with Dr. Dixon. And we are in the conference room, actually the classroom. The young people are going to be coming in pretty soon. What's the lesson for today, Professor? Well, it's a weather analysis class. And so the goal for today is to look at archived radar data, past storm events. Uh, I've somewhat not so cleverly removed all the identifying information from the event so they can't just recall what happened. And they have to look at the data, figure out where the most dangerous parts of the storm are, and try to assess what the danger might be. Since they won't see this, you're actually using a Dodge City tornado that you've superimposed or repositioned, right? That's right. I put it on uh, the radar. So the radar data from Dodge are, have been placed on the radar site for Amarillo. Mm -hmm. So it looks even more scary because the tornado of the day ends up going right down the main avenue of of Amarillo, so it should give them a little more alarm seeing that there's a population at risk there. What uh, do you want them to take away from the uh, uh, classroom experience, Dr. Dixon? The biggest objective for today, and actually for this next week that's an ongoing assignment, is quickly identify the risk and assess it uh, so that you can relay it as rapidly as possible. Well, let's talk about tornadoes now. You did a presentation for the Science Cafe here a couple of months ago on tornadoes. What do we need to know, Dr. Dixon? Oh, man. This, this program is not long enough, um, <laughs> but the, the sh I guess the simplest thing is just find out what you don't know. Uh -huh. And so on a daily basis, have a way to be told when there is a risk. And that's mm -hmm. the most frustrating part as someone who follows the weather every single day. And then friends and family and the general public find themselves in dangerous situations that were easily avoidable because they were completely ignorant, almost willfully ignorant. Uh, for just a few bucks, you know, maybe three to five dollars, you can have a really reliable app on your phone. Uh, for 15 or 20 bucks, you can get a weather radio that alerts you in a really unmistakable, alarming fashion. There's no reason to be ignorant when you're at risk of severe weather on a given day. Now, beyond that, how you choose to react to the warnings, that's up to you. Uh, you're making informed decisions at that point, and if you make the bad one, you know, that's on you, I suppose. But just being ignorant in the beginning, I think that's unacceptable. Matter of fact, you uh, uh, had a real life experience where uh, b behind us here we see uh, a severe weather alert which is going to affect some areas in southeastern United States. So you called some folks in Mississippi, uh, your uh, home uh, state, and they were unaware. Well, that's true. And uh, some of them were unaware. Some of them uh, had already made a note to call me. I'm going to be traveling later today, so I'm going to be away from uh, the ability to look at radar whenever the biggest show is going on in the Deep South today. And so I wanted to let the people that tend to rely on me, probably more than they should, they should probably have other <laughs> methods, I wanted to let them know, I'm going to be out of, the, out of the game today, so you need to figure out other ways to get your information. Dr. Dixon, are tornadoes becoming more severe, more frequent now? That's an interesting question. Um, depends on who you ask. Hmm. And people's perceptions run wild. Hmm. People's perceptions are that tornadoes are becoming less intense or less frequent in certain places of the country if they haven't had one in the last 10 years. Hmm. And then other places that have had a couple in memorable fashion think they're becoming more frequent. The research is starting to show in a somewhat consistent pattern that we're not getting more, we're not getting fewer. However, the character is changing. We tend to be getting fewer days with tornadoes, but the days we have seem to be more productive. I don't know if that's good or bad. Actually, I tend to think that it's worse uh, because more productive days 
means you're probably going to have more outbreaks. You're probably going to expose more populated areas. But that seems to be the trend emerging from uh, the best research out there right now. And can you attribute any of this to climate change? Still trying to figure that out. Uh, you know, there's so many signals with tornado research. One is that we're better at detecting them. We're better at reporting them. We are better at alerting about them. Uh, we can detect ones that before we never knew were occurring and we didn't have the resources to go out and look for evidence of them. So that's all improving. So there's this signal that's not a real change. We think we can control for that pretty well. Um, and so then we have all these other issues that you know, some seem to be pointing this way and some seem to be pointing this way uh, and teasing out that signal. That's why it's hard work. That's why we don't have an answer yet. Uh, as for the effect on climate change, it also seems to be suggesting that it would cause what we think we're seeing, fewer events that tend to be more prolific. Um, but that's not 100% of what we're seeing. And as far as trying to project, project into the future, uh, we, we think what will probably happen is places that did not used to see them will start seeing them more frequently. I don't expect places like Kansas will have a significant change over the next several years. Can tornadoes, I think I read that tornadoes have occurred in every month can they occur most anywhere in the uh, continental United States? They can. Every state has seen them. Alaska has seen them. Hawaii has seen them. Uh, they've occurred in every month. They've not occurred in every month in every state. Mm -hmm. you know, so tornado season is a confusing concept. It is not a national event. Tornado season in Minnesota looks nothing like tornado season in Georgia or Florida, for example. Um, the most active part of the year is April through June, if you're counting the whole country. And for Kansas, that happens to be the same for us. But if you live in the Deep South, this is their season. Their season essentially runs from November through April. Mm -hmm. And if you live in the far northern parts of the country, uh, so North Dakota over to, say, New England, your tornado season really doesn't begin until late June and then runs through maybe August or so. And then you have a, another little spike with hurricanes. They tend to produce tornadoes when they make landfall. Mm -hmm. So the coastal locations have an enhanced part of their season associated with hurricanes. But of course, some years they make landfall, some years they don't. So it's really inconsistent in most other parts of the world except for Kansas. Right in the central Great Plains, our season is very predictable. Every May and June, we are going to have tornadoes in the state. And then when those months are over, the tornadoes are typically over too, with some exceptions. We've had some notable ones recently in the months of November and December, but those are relatively rare. And during the Science Cafe presentation, you alluded to Tornado Alley. Talk a bit about that. Actually, the title of the talk was Tornado Valley, and it is a new term that I'm floating out there to my colleagues to see if it gets any traction. The reason I'm doing this is that, again, with the seasons, it's confusing as to when people are really at risk. And I think part of the reason we have this confusion is that we try to come up with these clever names. Yes, I understand the irony that I am uh, trying to submit a new name, but Tornado Alley sounds like something that's narrow, very localized. Uh -huh. Alleys are typically skinny, right? Mm -hmm. So people think that their alleys are sometimes smaller than the size of a state. Mm -hmm. uh, in reality, what it was originally meant to be was the Great Plains, mm -hmm. Texas through Nebraska or Iowa, something like that. Well, then we started realizing how at risk the Deep South is. And somebody not so cleverly decided to call it Dixie Alley. So an alley of tornadoes in Dixie. What I'm showing is that there's no separation between these two areas. The timing is different. And some of the characters, uh, characteristics of these storms are different. But really, if you just plot all the tornadoes on a map, from Atlanta to Denver, from Dallas to Minneapolis, there's no safe spot. There's no break. It's one big blob, and it roughly fits nicely between the Rocky Mountains and the Appalachians. So I'm saying maybe if we started calling it Tornado Valley. It's a valley. Yes, it literally is a valley, mm -hmm. and it moves us away from these ideas of small localized areas mm -hmm. and suggests it's a big region. Talk to us a little bit about uh, tornado myths. Oh, man. I, I never uh, stop being surprised at the things I hear that people think tornadoes can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. uh, Hayes is a great example. People are confident that the rather large hill by Kansas standards out to the southwest protects us from tornadoes. No, it just keeps us from seeing them as they're approaching. <laughs> so this is very much people with their head in the sand. I've only lived here two and a half years, and I've seen three or four tornadoes within 10 miles of downtown Hayes. Mm -hmm. 
other people don't see them, I guess they think they're not happening. <laughs> they don't exist. Uh, if anything, there is some evidence that a downhill slope actually intensifies or increases the chances of tornadoes by a tiny amount. Hmm. Uh, so that is one that I hear very commonly. There are lots of others, you know, that it, you can't have a tornado if it's raining. Hmm. That happens all the time in the deep south, rain-wrapped tornadoes. Uh, most dangerous because you can't see them coming. Crossing uh, water. Oh, yeah, crossing water. That's a know. good one for haze, too. That or, or that, you know, other features like maybe interstates attract them. So it just depends on what your recent mm -hmm. memories are. If you mm -hmm. see, if you think you've had a lot lately, you think the things near you attract them mm -hmm. or you think they deter them. I, I met a lady yesterday, actually, from Bennington, just up by Salina, and she told me that uh, something about the tree line or something or the highway had yeah. protected Bennington for years. Mm -hmm. To be fair, Bennington hasn't been hit, but Bennington's about this big compared to nearby towns, and there have been two violent, very infamous tornadoes that have passed within uh, a mile or two of Bennington in just in the last three to four years. So I wouldn't be feeling so safe if I lived in Bennington. What about uh, tornadoes seem to uh, uh, come more at night? Is that a valid statement? Depends on where you live. Uh, there are some parts of the country, primarily in the east, uh, places like Tennessee, Arkansas, Kentucky, Alabama, uh, they have a large portion of their tornadoes approaching half that occur after hours, after dark. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the clock time, it's not that different from what we have in Kansas, but it's the time of year. We have our tornadoes in May and June. It gets dark much later. Mm -hmm. They have their tornadoes in, say, February and March. Well, it got dark at 530. And so if the tornado happens at 7 o'clock in February, it's going to be dark as opposed to here with still daylight. That's a big difference. And, of course, that makes it more dangerous because mm -hmm. of the lack of visibility. National Weather Service has talked about uh, a couple of different terms, spotters versus chasers when it comes to tornado observers. Mm -hmm. um, and the chasers seem to be, well, we had the, the tragic incident in Texas where we lost three mm -hmm. tornado chasers at the time. Talk a little about chasers and spotters. A uh, storm spotter is, is something that's been around, been used by the Weather Service for a long time, and it's usually a local network of people. They go to a spot and they report in advance where they are going. It's usually a high visibility location, and they report back what they see. When the storm passes, they come back home. And so it's very much localized, very little travel involved. Uh, with, prior, with prior training yes, to spot Yes, with those. prior training. Usually uh -huh. volunteer firefighters and law enforcement officers are involved in this and some local citizens as well. Storm chasers are not tied to a home base typically. They will travel wherever they want to go and they're more interested in seeing the storm throughout its life mm -hmm. rather than reporting on where it is relative to a particular town or community. And that's what we do with the class over the summer because it's important for us, for our students, to be able to see the storm as it goes through its life cycle. Mm -hmm. And so chasers are not typically out there for public protection. Most of them, us included, we will report to the Weather Service always first when we see something particularly dangerous. Um, but we don't hang around. We're not going to stay and wait for the next storm to come through that town. We're going to stay with the one that we're on more than likely. And that's the difference between literally following or chasing the storm versus remaining in a spot in a single location and reporting what you see. How did you get interested in uh, weather, tornadoes, and climate? Hey, you know, there wasn't one event. Uh, I grew up in a, in a mobile home in the deep south, and so we had lots of nighttime tornadoes. I was always interested and terrified. <laughs> Spent lots of time outside because uh, we knew we couldn't, we shouldn't be inside the trailer. So our mm -hmm. safe space, and I should say safe because it was a, the least bad location at the time, yeah. was to be outside in a ditch. Uh, so I was always very weather aware. And I started thinking about majoring in weather as a high school kid. Of course, this was really pre-internet, so I couldn't look up what the options were. And I eventually gave up because my high school counselor said, are you sure you want to be on television? No, I guess not. So, <laughs> <coughs> so I went into engineering, and the first college course I ever took was intro to meteorology. I thought I'd take it as an elective, mm -hmm. and I changed majors first semester. Wow. And we're thankful for you bringing your expertise. A lot of young people are going to be connected with weather information, maybe they'll solve some of these problems of tornadoes and locations and such with Absolutely. your work. Dr. Grady Dixon, Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Geosciences at Fort Hayes State University, is our Community Connection.
Angels Care Home Health, serving Hayes and the surrounding areas, is a Medicare-certified home health agency providing quality skilled nursing and restorative therapy services to patients in their homes. My Angel Care physical therapist taught me how to do exercises safely. Angels Care is there to help 24 hours a day, and all services are covered 100% by Medicare for patients who are eligible. It gives us independence in our home. Angels Care Home Health. We serve patients.